Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Dr. Greg Steinberg, and, and welcome to the Five Fundamentals of Mental Toughness in Tennis. It's sponsored by the International Association of Tennis Psychology. We'll talk about that a little bit later with their online course. But it's definitely a, a privilege and an honor for you uh, to share your time with me. Uh, and I hope uh, you won't be disappointed. Um, but let me start by telling you a, a little background of mine. I grew up playing competitive tennis. I was a ranked tennis player in Southern California. That's me. This is the 70s, okay? So that's definitely a hair don't. Um, we used to play with wood rackets, right? Most of us know that. And those shirts, oh, I'm glad they went out of style. Uh, and check out the cars in the background. So it's definitely, definitely the 70s. And I played every weekend. I played in high school and I was totally into it, totally competitive. And I always wondered why sometimes I played great and sometimes I choked and other players, they could beat me even though it didn't seem like they had the same amount of talent. And I always wanted to kind of find the secret sauce to success. Uh, what made people so successful under pressure? Because in a lot of cases, it wasn't me. Uh, so I basically went on a quest uh, in the sense of in college, I studied um, psychology at the University uh, UC Santa Barbara. And then I went to Florida State and studied performance psychology. And then I went to University of Florida and got my PhD in performance psychology. Everybody asked me who I root for between Florida State and the University of Florida. And it's basically whoever has a better football team that year, because we know it always goes back and forth. And in the, in the last 22 years, I've been a professor of sports psychology at Austin P State University, which is just outside Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, so I get it from really three different angles. One, I was a competitive player. Uh, I know the science because that's what I've been doing and researching the science and the, the, uh, the, the basic um, fundamentals from a, a research background. But also, I um, have been a consultant. I've uh, worked with um, some pro tennis players, a lot of collegiate teams. I worked at Vanderbilt. Uh, with their men's team for a bunch of years, and they went to the NCAA finals. I worked with a bunch of uh, juniors. Um, so I get it from like a 360 angle. So I know a lot of you who are on the webinar tonight and who are going to be listening uh, are coaches. Some of you are players. Um, so I'm going to share with you, uh, you know, from those three angles, you know, from my experiences and all my research and my consulting. Um, and what's interesting is when, when people find out I'm a sports psychologist, I typically get the same two questions. The first one is, what percentage of tennis is mental? Is it 40%, 30%, 80%? Well, I like to say that tennis is 100% mental, 100% physical. You can't tease one from the other. When you're thinking bad, you're playing bad, and when you're playing bad, you're thinking worse, and you get this downward spiral, right? On the flip side, when you're thinking good and you're playing better and you start thinking even better, you get the upward spiral. The biggest problem that I see is that most people appreciate the mental game. I know you appreciate the mental game. That's why you're on this webinar. But most people don't know how to work on the mental game. And so one of my goals tonight is to share with you how to work on the mental game, give you the tools and the strategies to help yourself or if you're a coach to help, help your players. The other question I get is, why do you see some players in college, let's say, they're, they're great, but they, they can never make it to the next level, or they're in high school and then they can never make it to college. You know, what allows people to raise their game under pressure? Well, I like to say this, you have talent, I have talent, most of us have talent, uh, but the problem is, some people have thoughts and emotions which push their talents down, where other people have thoughts and emotions which allow them to raise their game under pressure. They know how to perform in the storm, I like to say. But ultimately, what I, what I say is they have the right mental juice. And, and that mental juice is what raises their game under pressure. And so a great way to explain that is with this orange. 
So let me say it with three questions. First question is, if I squeeze this orange, what comes out? Orange juice, right? Orange juice always comes out, not pineapple juice, orange juice. Second question, why? Why does orange juice always come out? Because that is what is inside. Level three question, what have you put inside? If you put in fear and negativity and doubt, that's what comes out when you get squeezed. Because we all get squeezed on the tennis court. It's a lot of pressure to play. Uh, we all get squeezed in life. But the most successful people on the tennis court in life, when they get squeezed, because that's a human condition, they put in the right mental juice. They put in confidence and peace of mind and joy. And so that juice allows them to raise their game under pressure. So ultimately, it's my goal tonight to share with you and to show you how to put in the right juice so that you can play your best under pressure, so, you, that, you, so that you can perform in the storm and you can play your best when it really counts. And what I like is to share with you an overall framework because what I like is if I can see an overall framework, I can kind of see how the pieces fit. And my philosophy I've developed is called the MAP mental game system. And it's real simple, but it's really effective. M stands for you are your best model, okay? You're not like Rafa, you're not like Roger Federer, you're not like Serena Williams, you are special, you are unique, and you gotta be your own best model. You gotta figure out what makes you tick and what doesn't make you tick. And you gotta figure out why you played your best and move in that direction, which is the second point, is you have to attune yourself to your, uh, when you're thinking correct and playing well, and you have to tune yourself to your strengths. What I mean by that is a lot of cases, we focus on the negative, right? We focus on where we're playing bad and why we're playing bad. And when we focus on the negative, we basically go to the negative. That's the irony. You gotta get the irony out of your mental game. You want to focus on the positive. You want to focus on why you're playing well, and you got to focus on why you're playing well. And once you know that, you can move in the right direction. And so you want to focus on why you do stuff right. That's the ultimate secret of sports psychology. And then the third part is you then practice effective habits to make sure you're going in that direction. You're grooving that path because we know in psychology, we go to our habits under pressure. When we get squeezed, our habits come out. So you got to have the right effective habits. So once you know yourself, you know what direction to go, you know what makes you tick, then you create the right habits. It's real simple and real effective. And that's what I'm going to basically share with you all night tonight is the MAP mental game system. And I'm going to cover it, what I think are the five mental keys. You have to know yourself, self-awareness. You gotta know where you're going. You um, have to boost confidence, but really confidence is a choice. You have to harness the power of anxiety. You have to be in the moment, you know, focus, and you have to be inspired to practice and compete. So we're, we're gonna go over those five tonight. So let's talk about the first one. So self-awareness, let me give you an example. Naomi Osaka, she's playing Coco Goff in the third round of the US Open. I don't know if you saw that match, but it, uh, Osaka probably played the best tennis the whole year. I know she won the, the Australian, but after that, she wasn't playing very well. But in this match, she was amazing. And she said she was totally pumped up to play Coco Goff. You know, that was she's the teen sensation, all the media is focusing on her. And she actually knows uh, Osaka, uh, uh, knows Coco Goff and, and likes her. But what I'm getting at is her intensity level was really, really high. The next match, well, she won, right? The next match, she loses, okay? So to me, the awareness part is when she's playing at, let's say, an 80, if you, if you look at a scale, 100 is totally, totally amped, zero is totally flat. Basically, at an 80, that's when she's playing her best, maybe even a 90. But that's not the same for you. Maybe you need to be at a 40. Maybe you need to be at a 70. Uh, I need to be at about a 40, uh, 50. I can't be that pumped up. I don't like it. So again, you have to be your own best model. So when I work with players, the first thing I ask them is, I say, when you are playing your best, 
what were you thinking and feeling? What was your intensity level? Uh, were you confident? Were you nervous? Because sometimes we play our best when we're nervous. I also focus a little bit on when they're playing their worst, just kind of get a contrast there, but not too much. I want to focus on when they're playing their best. And then, you know, the best thing to do is have them write it down, have you write it down. You know, we're, we can't interact because it's a webinar, but if we were interacting one-on-one, -on -one, I'd have you write this down. Uh, you know, tell me a time when you were in the zone, where it was, and you maybe do two or three of those and, and, and figure out patterns. But ultimately, know why. Why were you playing your best? You know, was it because uh, you practiced really hard for the week? You were playing someone you hated. You were playing someone you liked. Your parents were in the stands. They weren't in the stands. So all those things, the why is really, really, really important. And, you know, the why factor, which I call, is uh, so important because you have to know why you have that peace of mind when those days you were just so comfortable on the court. Why were you confident? Why were you inspired to practice and compete? Knowing yourself is the key to moving in the right direction. So, so that's the first thing I do with all my players. And it's real important if you're a coach uh, to, to do that with your players. Uh, the next thing is, um, let me talk about confidence. So confidence is a choice. You know, when I, when I work with young players, I say, when you're playing bad, that, that confidence train will leave the station pretty fast, right? Uh, it's so easy to lose your confidence but confidence is a choice. And if you believe that, and it's true, it empowers you. You can always choose to be confident. I don't care if you double faulted four times in a row, you can still choose to be confident about your serve. I don't care if you dump the last two volleys in the net, you can still be confident that you're a great volleyer. So I wanna tell you a story that I really like. It's about Serena Williams and her sister, Venus Williams. You know, they were double partners and they won a lot of tournaments, right? Well, this story was written by Serena, so it's not hearsay. It's actually what she wrote, and she, they're playing this tournament. And I'm going to paraphrase it, but she basically said, Venus, you're giving up. You're not trying at all. We are out here to win. I'm out here to win, and I want you to be confident that we can win. And it showed me that Serena always chose to be confident. She chooses to be confident. And that's what makes her a great champion. You know, most people think the greatest woman player of all time. And, 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 and the idea is that it's really important to believe you always have that choice. Because what happens is in a match, you're going to go up and down. You're going to have some bad games. You're going to have some good games. Even through a season, you're going to have some bad spells. And you're going to have some really good spells. But when you're on that downward spiral, if you – doubt yourself, you lose confidence, you start overthinking, that's when you can really get into a slumping pattern. But you gotta accept that we always go up and down, we always go up and down, accept it and don't lose your confidence. Choose to be confident and you'll get out of that little mini slump. Now, I wanna give you some pragmatic ways to choose to be confident. So the, the four factors to me which impact or confidence are what you say, which is self-talk, what you think, visualization, how you act, and what you do. But I want to ask you a question right now. Which one of these four do you think are most important? So which one do you think leads to uh, the greatest level of confidence? Most people don't get it right. But let me give you an example, because you'll get it when I give you the example. So I'm five foot eight. Let's say I tell myself, I can dunk a basketball. I can dunk a basketball. I can dunk a basketball. And then I visualize myself dunking over and over again. And I totally act like I can dunk. I could never dunk a basketball. I can't even touch the net. So it's really what you do leads to confidence, the, the key factor. Now, if you're close, then this other three work. And the other three are what I call spices. And they're really important. And you know, like, you can serve it over the net. So those three are important. But the idea is if you can't do it, uh, it's hard to be confident with the other three. So again, um, number four is the most important. And you know, that's when you're teaching, you're teaching kids and you're taking baby steps and maybe they're hitting serves off the T line. Well, yeah, and you know, you build up. And I don't wanna focus too much on that. I wanna focus on the other three. Uh, but basically you gotta be able, you, you need to be close so the other three works. So what you say. Now, when I was growing up, 
this was my saying. I'm bringing my A game. I'm bringing my A game. I'm bringing my A game. What that meant was I'm not giving up. I don't care how many games I'm down. I don't care if I'm down one set and it's five love my opponent. I'm not giving up. I'm bringing my A game. And I'm going to practice so when I get on the court, I'm bringing my A game. And that really helped me. Now, that might work for you, but it might not. The secret is figure out what you need to say to boost your confidence. Have like what I call buzzwords. Now, how you do that goes back to that first principle. Once you've written down, like when you're in the zone, you want to circle some, let's say, emotionally charged words. And then from those words, you can kind of figure out what would be some really good buzzwords for you. Maybe it's find the fire. I know when I was working with some players at Vanderbilt, that they like to use that, find the fire. And then they would slap their leg. That really got them pumped up and confident. You know, the idea is that you got to figure out what works for you. You're unique. You're your best model. Figure out what works for you. Maybe it's be at peace. Maybe you need to find that peace. And that's going to make you play well and be confident. And yes, that's the North Shore of... Uh, Hawaii. So you got to figure out what images, what actions, and what words works for you, and then that helps you move in the right direction. Now let me talk about visualization. Uh, probably one of the key ingredients to your mental game package. But first I want to talk about that visualizations really shows us there's this mind-body connection. And so let me share with you, I do this in my class every semester, and I have a little paper clip right here at the end, and it's on a string, and I'm going to visualize the paper clip moving this way, okay? My hand's not moving at all. Look at the paper clip. My hand is totally still. Wow. That's pretty cool, right? Well, Visualization shows us there's this mind-body connection. If you're serving and you see the ball not going in the court, you're gonna tighten up. And you, it's very subtle, you might not feel it, but that muscle tightness might prevent you know, your shoulder doing the right thing. Or you visualize the ball going exactly where you want when you're serving with the right spin, it frees you up and you're more comfortable. So visualization promotes this mind-body connection. And Novak says visualization is one of the key factors to his mental game package. But some people can't visualize. It's hard for, to visualize. So let me share with you one really cool tip to visualize and to help your students visualize. We are hand dominant. We talk with our hands. We eat with our hands. So you're gonna, it's going to help you to visualize with your hands. So let's say you return and serve and you're right-handed and you're, you think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail this return cross court with my forehand. Well, in your routine, you might just kind of do this and feel that motion and see it, and you're totally confident, right? Another example uh, to visualize and help you visualize is every time uh, you had, let's say, a great match or even some great shots during a match, you put in your golden nugget book. Oh, I, mean, I nailed that serve, I aced him. And you know, you might wanna record what it was feeling and, and what you were thinking. And you put that in your tennis bag and look at that. So that helps bring up these good thoughts, these good uh, visualizations. Because uh, to me, when you visualize, you have greater feel. And the greater feel you have, the greater player you're going to be, right? So visualization promotes feel, and feel promotes you to be a better player. So the more you visualize, the better player you're going to be, right? So visualization is, is a key factor in anyone's mental game package. And it's something I always work with. How you act, okay, I gotta go on Nick, right? Nick is, but I, I like Nick. So he's got immense talent, right? Everybody knows that. I mean, amazing talent. Maybe the most talented guy on, on the tour. Well, you know, top five. But when the ump doesn't make a call that he likes, he freaks out. He gets all, you know, you can see in his body language. As soon as he goes, it's over for him. And we've seen that time and time again. So his actions really impacts his mental game. Now, one person I love who totally has positive energy is this guy, Diego Schwartzman. I mean, he's, he's like five foot five. He's got probably one of the best mental games on tour. Uh, I love this guy. And he's always positive. Um, 
never negative. I've never seen him be negative. Now, one cool thing I really like about his mental game, I'm not sure if he does this on purpose. He might do it intuitively. But, you know, he's wearing his hat backwards. Well, when the point's over, he kind of puts it up. And then when the point starts, he puts it down like kind of like a check. Okay, let's get focused. Really cool. Watch him. He does that every time. Well, maybe not every time, but a lot of times. Just he's got a great mental game, and that's why he, he plays so well under pressure. So what I want to do right now is I just want to stop for a minute and, and talk about the International Association of Tennis Psychology. So this webinar is sponsored by this association. And because you're on this webinar, you could take the webinar for half off. Um, and let me, let me kind of just show you. I have to get out of this. Yes, we are live. And let me just show you this course. A couple things, and this is why I wanted to show it to you. It's been approved by the uh, United States Professional Tennis Association, USPTA, for continuing education. So that's really cool. Um, and it, it's just like the webinar. It has these, uh, basically, this six keys uh, motivation practice are put together in the webinar tonight. But every section has videos, articles, and applied exercises for you to master the mental game. Uh, and there's a lot of free stuff on here too. So if you go to sample the tennis psychology course, go to sample confidence lesson, a lot of the stuff, go to video, I'm doing this kind of fast, right? Um, there's all these videos on there, like there's 10 videos. We've gone through confidence really fast, but you can see the whole uh, confidence section, articles, videos, applied exercises. Um, and, and so a lot of free stuff. Now, if you're doing the webinar, you can, uh, if you want to go into a lot more depth, when you do the course access, just put in the promo code webinar 199. Uh, you get it for half off because it's typically 399. And, and when you do the course, you get a certificate from the IATP uh, saying you passed the course and you're a tennis psychology expert in, in from uh, passing this course. So I'll talk a little more about that in a minute, but or a little later, I should say. So I just wanted to kind of share with you um, an overall um, vision of, of, of the course. And, you know, we're doing stuff pretty fast tonight and kind of giving you a taste really of, of what's on the course. I, I created it with a, a few other sports psychologists. And so you're getting like 30 years of mental game expertise. So that's what's pretty cool about that course. So let's go to number three. Harness the power of anxiety. So let me take you back 40,000 years ago when we were hunters and gatherers. We uh, ran like heck or we fought, but we were afraid of dying. Uh, and that fear promoted anxiety in us. Fear is what li is linked to anxiety. That's what causes all anxiety. But we're not afraid of dying anymore. We're afraid of looking foolish. We're afraid, uh, afraid of playing bad. We're afraid of letting our parents down, our friends, our teammates. Um, but the good news is, 40,000 years ago, the way we survived is the fight or flight response. We either fought or we ran like heck. And that produced hormones in our body, which can make us superhuman. It can make us think better. It can make us have greater feel. It can make us jump higher. And so when you harness the power of anxiety, it can make you play better. And that's what Billie Jean was trying to say in her book. Privilege is a, um, I'm sorry, pressure is a privilege. When you label anxiety in a positive way, you harness the power to your advantage. So she would say, you know, when I was in Wimbledon, I would say it's a privilege to be here and she could play better because she's harnessing that power. You have to label this uh, pressure situation as a challenge. And that's how you turn pressure into pleasure. Uh, you know, most of the time people do it the other way around. They turn a pleasurable day in, of tennis into pressure. Like, what am I, what if, what are my friends going to think if I play bad? Well, what, what, what's my coach going to think? So, it, you know, the best players, they turn pressure into pleasure. They see it as a privilege. And, and, and so when you label it, you move in the right direction. But let me also say that anxiety is, is twofold. It's not only what you think, but it's also what you feel. You know, when, when we're anxious, we get the butterflies, we get our throat kind of tingly, my ears all tingle, and my eyesight goes pitter-patter. So you have to do something else. 
And Bianca basically said she meditates. Now, a lot of players meditate. She said this is a big part of her mental package. Let me explain what meditation is all about. It's really simple. Well, you know, at night after a warm shower, you just sit down, you focus on your breathing, maybe close your eyes, you relax your toes, you relax your calves, you relax your abdominals, move all the way to the top of your head, and then say a word like cool or smooth in your mind every time you breathe out. And do this for like five minutes. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why that works so effective in a minute. But if you look at that last statement, it says the relaxation response is stronger than the anxiety response. So meditation is really the relaxation response. And once you practice it for maybe two or three weeks, it can overcome anxiety. You know, when you go to a tournament and you say, just relax, just relax, you can't. But once you've practiced it at home, you can bring it on the tennis court. So one of the facets that's real important about the mental game is you've got to do it off the court to bring it on the court. And I'm going to talk about a couple other factors later, but it's real important to do that. But not only is meditation really important for your tennis game. It's important for your health, for your life. Uh, I'll tell you a really cool story. So I have all my students do meditation at the start of our sports psychology class. I've been doing this for a long time. And one student, he was a little older. He, he, gave, he came back from Afghanistan. He was a soldier. Uh, and he said he had post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and he wrote me about five weeks in the class. And he said, you know, when I started your class, my mind was all foggy. But after meditating, it was like the fog cleared. Wow, that's so cool. It's because meditation is just really beneficial to us. Now, once you practiced it and you use your word, that word can get you relaxed. And I'm going to share with you what you want to do in this next section and how to use that, which is really uh, be in the moment. But before I share with you uh, using that in the, in the pre-show routine, let me talk about this guy, Rafa, which is probably, he's probably got the best mental game uh, on tour today, maybe of all time. Um, you know, people can question that, but it's pretty darn good. And let me tell you, success leaves clues. You know, the idea is like, what makes him so good, right? Well, we all know that Rafa plays every point as hard as he can. What, what that does is he's playing match point at the same intensity level as he's playing the first point. What that does is he's, that means he's totally in the moment. He's not focused on score or outcome. That gets you out of the moment. That gets your nerves, you know, up and down. But what he's really doing is he's basically playing every point at the same level. And so he's totally in the moment. And I think that's one of his, like, the secret sauce to his success. Every point is important. He doesn't let down on any point. And that's how he stays fully engaged. Success leaves clues. And that's a huge clue that Rafa is telling us. But let me also talk about the pre-show routine. So I know everybody's heard about the pre-show routine, but let me talk about what the serve, okay? It's what we do prior to a, a self-paced task. The serve and typically your serving routine is when you can do a pre-shot routine. So to me, most people get the routine wrong. They just think it's a, you know, some behaviors you do right before the shot. That's not correct. It's your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors before a shot that puts you into an emotional bubble so that the pressure can just bounce off. It's basically preparing yourself for excellence. When you have a great pre-shot routine, you're getting prepared for excellence, right? And I think a great pre-shot routine has three R's. It has relax, reactive mind, and rhythm. So let me talk a little bit about all three. So I think to start your routine, you should shrug your shoulders, get the tension out of your shoulders. You know, if there's tension there, it's hard to serve. You might breathe. And, you know, we talked about breathing out and then saying your, your, your word like smooth or cool, and that gets you relaxed because you've been practicing that at home. So now you're, you're relaxed. And the more relaxed you are, the faster you can snap that racket and serve harder. You also want to not overthink. And I call, when, you're at the, when you get to... Um, the service line, you want to be in the play box, right? Now you're just reacting. You're seeing the target go. Maybe when you're, you know, getting your balls and getting ready, you're kind of maybe thinking about what you're doing. But once you get there, you're in the play box and you're just reacting. You're visualizing your shot. You're just reacting. It's almost like you turn off the analytical mind 
and you're just in the reactive mind. We know when you're in the zone, you're in the reactive mind. And then rhythm. Now, I have this guy uh, right here, Federer. To me, he's got uh, amazing rhythm when he serves, right? And the rhythm before his serve promotes the rhythm during his serve. So maybe it's one and go for you. Maybe you like one and two and go. Whatever it is, you got to find some type of rhythm that promotes rhythm in, in your serve. Now, I'm going to take us back a few years. When I was playing tennis, Johnny Mack had the most rhythmical serve. Now, what he did was his first one, so he, this is his racket, he'd go down a little bit, and then the second one, he'd go down even more, and the third one, he'd go down even farther, and then boom. You know, he was like an artist on, on the tennis court. I mean, he really was. And uh, I try to emulate that rhythm. So the idea is your pre-shot routine has to promote rhythm. If your routine is rhythmical, your service motion is going to be rhythmical, right? So having those three R's are really key. Uh, another thing too is if you bounce it twice, always bounce it twice. Be consistent because it, it tells your body something. So for instance, when you're goofing around with your friends uh, or you're just practicing your serve, you bounce it twice, you're relaxed. But you get into a, a tough situation in a match and now you bounce it four times and sometimes three and sometimes five. It tells your body, ah, there's something wrong and you're going to feel more tension. So be consistent with the bounce and that promotes uh, relaxation, it promotes rhythm, and it promotes a reactive mind. So those are the three R's. I also wanna talk about the post shot routine. So let me talk about it with this paper airplane. Okay, I'm gonna fly this paper airplane across the room, right? Imagine if I put a bunch of pennies in that paper airplane, what would it do? It would just dive straight down. It would be grounded. Same thing with you. When you have all this negative baggage, it grounds you, it weighs you down. You can't move on to the next point. So when I worked at Vanderbilt with Ken Flack, so Ken Flack was the coach. I don't know if you know his name, but Flack and Seguso, right? The famous doubles team. They won um, Wimbledon, US Open. They won the gold medal in the Olympics in 1988. Ken was an amazing coach, right? He, he taught me a lot of cool stuff. He also said when, after each point, he'd always walk up the doubles alley. He wouldn't walk down the center. He'd always walk up the doubles alley. And that was kind of his way to release the negative energy of the point. Some people fiddle with their strings. Some people maybe say next point. Some people brush it off. I think you need a physical trigger and a mental trigger just to kind of let go of that energy so that you can move on and be totally engaged in the next point. So the secret is what works for you, figure out what works for you, you're your own best model, and then move in the right direction. The map mental game system, right? The other thing I want to talk about is everybody does this. When you practice being distracted, you become distracted. When you have a bad habit, it becomes who you are, right? So we practice being distracted. We're totally multitasking. We're doing five things at once. The problem is when we do that off the tennis court, right? That becomes who we are on the tennis court. So if, if, for instance, we get home and our son or daughter talks to us about their homework assignment and your mind wanders to the office, you're practicing being distracted. Or you're at the office and your colleague tells you about something and your mind's wandering, you're practicing being distracted. So that when you go on the tennis court, guess what? Your mind's gonna wander. It's hard to be totally focused. But when you find your mind wandering off the tennis court and you say something like, be here now, pull all your energy to that moment, then when you're on the tennis court, you can be more engaged. Because remember, we have to practice effective habits. And when the, the habits are effective, when we get squeezed, that's the juice that comes out. So you got to practice being in the moment so that you can be in the moment on the tennis court. So the fifth key I want to talk about is to be inspired to practice and compete. Because if you're not inspired to practice, it's hard to get uh, much better. So Rafa has always uh, said every time he goes on the tennis court to practice, he's working on something to get better. He has a growth mindset. Look at his serve, how much he's gotten better when he started on the tour and now. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, Roger Federer has been working on his backhand. It's got even better, uh, and it was already great. Um, the idea is that 
to be great, you have to have a growth mindset. You got to work on uh, getting better, but you also have to have a champion mindset, which I mean, you got to, you got to be okay with playing competition because competition is, uh, I would say, a laboratory to see what we need to fix because it puts all that pressure on you. And so you want to play competition. You want to play tournaments. You want to try to win tournaments. Um, it might not be your major goal, but you want to play tournaments so you can put yourself under the pressure cooker so that you can see what you need to work on. You know, there's a balance there. And the great players, the ones that are most successful, have a balance. They're, they not only have a growth mindset, but they have a champion mindset. And that's how they raise their game. And they continually raise their game. And that's why Rafa and Roger continually get better and better every year. Amazing. The other thing I want to talk about is um, practicing. But let me first ask you a question. What is, do you think is the number one gripe of athletes? You know, the number one complaint. It's, it doesn't matter if it's tennis. It could be golf. It's across every sport. What do you think is the number one gripe? It's probably your gripe as well. It's not being able to take your best game from practice to competition. It's called transfer. And let me explain it this way. Practice is one animal. Competition is another animal. The farther they are away, the harder is it for your game to transfer. The closer you get them, the easier it is for your game to transfer from practice to competition. So you can do that in a couple ways. One is when you're playing uh, practice, you got to put a lot of pressure on yourself. So for instance, you're finishing up a long practice situation, get there on the service line and try to hit 10 serves in a row. If you can't make 10 serves in a row, you got to start all over. It's putting or 20 or 30, whatever it is. But when you get to that ninth one, you're going to feel the pressure. And if you don't hit all 10, you got to start over. You got to do something to put pressure on yourself. And that gets the practice animal closer to competition. But what we've been talking about tonight is getting competition closer to practice. So like when you have a great pre-shower routine and you're more relaxed, and you have a post-shower routine, and you know who you are, and you know how to get confident, this competition animal gets closer to the practice animal so that you play your best under pressure. You can perform in the storm, because that's what we all want to do. We want to play our best tennis when it counts, right? When we're playing in a tournament, or we're playing with our buddies, whatever it is, we want to play our best tennis when it really matters. And that's why you have to work on the mental game. Because if you don't work on the mental game, it's like playing tennis only with one hand. You can't do it. You gotta play tennis with both hands, let's say, euphemistically. And that allows you to play your best under pressure. That's why it is so important to work on the mental game. And I know a lot of people don't know how to facilitate that process with their, their students or themselves, and that's what the goal of this webinar was to share with you just a few things on how to work on the mental game. And again, you know, the secret is there, if, if, if you want to take the mental game serious and, and you want to work on the mental game, you know, and I challenge you to work on the mental game, the course is going to help you. It's going to really get you over the top. It's, there's just so much great information in there. Uh, you know, again, there's free stuff on there, but if you want to take your mental game to the next level, uh, the course is really going to help you. And again, taking the webinar, you get it for half price. And you can constantly look uh, at the, the online course as many times as you want. So again, um, it was definitely my privilege and my honor to share with you some of my thoughts about the mental game and uh, to help you play better tennis. Uh, and again, this is Dr. Greg Steinberg, and I really appreciate your time tonight.